Hello, and welcome to today's ACM Learning Webinar. This webcast is part of ACM's deep commitment to lifelong learning, aiming to empower computing professionals and students who join ACM's worldwide community of over 100,000 members. I'm Keith Miller, the Orthwine Endowed Professor for Lifelong Learning in the Sciences at the College of Education of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. My research interests include computer ethics, software testing, and online learning. ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. Our members stay competitive in the dynamic computing world with a range of ACM Learning Center online resources at learning.acm.org. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. ACM recognizes the role of computing in sustaining competitiveness in a global environment. The ACM provides timely computing information, including communications of the ACM and the Q magazines. They provide access to the ACM Digital Library, the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature. They sponsor international conferences that draw leading experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics. And the ACM supports education and research, including curricular development, teacher training, the ACM Turing and ACM Infosys Foundation Awards. The ACM enables its members to solve critical problems using new technology that enriches our lives and advances our society in the digital age. Before we get started, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide in front of you now. In the top right corner of the slide area on your screen, there is a button that will allow you to enlarge the slides. You may also enlarge the slides at any time by dragging the corner of the slide window. Don and I will advance the slides during the event. During this presentation, you can minimize the slide area, question and answer, and bio screens using the buttons on the bottom panel. You can also use a number of widgets also found on that bottom panel, including Facebook, Twitter, Wikipedia, and a resource list where you can get a copy of the slides. If you are experiencing problems with the web interface, please press the F5 key on your keyboard if you're using Windows, or the Command plus R if you're on the Mac to refresh your console or close and relaunch the presentation. You can also visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the help widget below the slide window. To control volume, please adjust the master volume on your computer. At the end of our presentation, we will have time for questions, and we hope you'll have several. If you think of a question during the presentation, please type it into the Q&A box and click on the Submit button. You don't need to wait until the end of the presentation to begin submitting these typed questions. You may also use the Q&A box and the survey at the end of the presentation to suggest topics for future ACM webinars. At the end of this presentation, you'll see a survey URL on the final slide. Please take a minute to fill it out to help us improve our webinars. This session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when it is available, or you can check learning.acm.org in a few days for updates. You can now use Facebook and Twitter widgets on the bottom panel to share the presentation link with your friends, as well as tweet comments and questions to us using the hashtag #ACMWebinarProf. We'll be watching for your tweets. Today's presentation is Computing Professionalism, Do Good and Avoid Evil, and Why It is Complicated to Do That in Computing. The presentation is by Dr. Don Goderbarn, my friend and collaborator. Don Goderbarn is director of the Software Engineering Ethics Research Institute and a professor emeritus at East Tennessee State University. Don is a visiting professor at the Center for Computing and Social Responsibility in England. Working as an academic and as a software systems developer, 
He has been active over several decades promoting responsible computing practices. He has taught at the University of Southern California at government agencies such as the NSA and was a visiting scientist at Carnegie Mellon's Software Engineering Institute. As a consultant, he worked on systems for the U.S. Navy and for the Saudi Arabian Navy. He worked on counting, vote counting machines and missile defense. Don also chairs the ACM Committee on Professional Ethics and was instrumental in the development of the IEEE's ACM Software Engineering Code of Ethics and Professional Practice. His contribution to computing ethics is recognized by various professional bodies, including the ACM and the International Society for Ethics and Information Technology. In my opinion, during the last 25 years, Don Goderbarn has been the single most influential person in the field of professional ethics for ICT professionals. I'm not the only one who has a high opinion of Don's contributions in this area. Don was awarded the ACM SIGCAS Making a Difference Award, an ACM Outstanding Contribution Award, the Weizenbaum Award from INSEAT, and he is currently the chair of the ACM's Committee on Professional Ethics. I could go on, but Don is so easily embarrassed, and we all want to hear what he has to say about professional ethics. Don? Uh, thank you, Keith. I'm glad you stopped. I also <laughs> want to thank East Tennessee State University for their consistent support of my focus on professionalism in computing, and thank the ACM for the opportunity to discuss these important issues. When people talk about computing, they often start with complaints. There are lots of complaints in the USA, for example, about the software used to sign up for the Affordable Care Act. People also complain about security breaches and crimes committed by those using computers. I try to do the right thing in computing. So I find this talk about crimes and mistakes boring and not very useful. Today I want to say something more relevant to the honest hard-working computer professionals who don't intend to do evil things and don't intend to do shoddy work. These are not two old guys with iPads, but Aristotle and Plato being catty about Socrates' view of ethics. Socrates had an incredibly optimistic view about ethics. He thought that if you know what is right, then you'll do it. Well, I'm not as optimistic as Socrates. But I do believe that people who want to do the right thing will be better able to do it if they are aware of the challenges they face. I believe that most computing professionals want to do the right thing. And so today I hope to support that desire. Today we'll look at how our approach to problem solving may actually limit our ability to do the right thing. I'll also suggest some ways to overcome these limits reducing their impact on our professional decisions. We will focus today on the positive side of professionalism. We'll identify some risks and difficulties we have in achieving professionalism and some strategies to mitigate the difficulties and reduce the risks. There are at least two sides to the concept of professional. Professionalism began as a religious concept where a monk would professes faith and the commitment to a life of service. This early conception of professionalism included a strong ethical component. I like to emphasize three levels of ethics in professional ethics. First, all citizens share some common ethical values. They share a value for honesty, for fairness, and uh, a commitment to do no harm. And all professionals also have ethical responsibilities by virtue of the special knowledge they have. They have an obligation beyond ordinary morality to use that knowledge. This is generally referred to as having a higher order of care. This level is shared by professionals from all different fields, software developers, physicians, lawyers, architects, for example, have roughly the same responsibilities at this level to exercise a higher order of care. There is a third level of ethics for professionals. This one's associated with the professional's specific field of specialization. On this level, 
the responsibility for computing professionals, physicians, lawyers, architects, are quite different. These are discipline-specific responsibilities. On this third level, there is, in addition to a strong knowledge component, there is a commitment to the professional's judgment. That is, the judgment they have gained through experience in working in the area and the knowledge they have. This third level is mostly what I'll be talking about today, the specific professional's ethics for software professionals. There is currently significant international effort interest in uh, professionalizing computing. Lately, the interest has become uh, almost a cottage industry. There's an alphabet soup of organizations working on it, including the ACM, the BCS, the IEEE Computer Society, IFIP, IP3. In addition, there's multinational government organizations are getting into the act. For example, UNESCO is involved with its 193 governments and 700 corporate partners. The European Union, with more than 20 countries and member states, has a major professionalism project. And in the US, I think there are about 10 states now who are considering licensing and licensing of software professionals. Now, why is there such an interest in professionalizing computing? That seems to be an obvious question, given this fervor. One answer is economic. Professionalized computing may be a competitive advantage. But there is something else going on here, I think. Given the degree to which computing is embedded in every aspect of our lives, from using cell phones as a flashlight to the invention of digital toothpicks, a central reason for our interest in professionalization is da, 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 um, to protect us from harm. Quoting the European Union's professionalism report, the most important reason for change, however, stems from the extent to which ICT has the potential to harm society. But what kinds of harms are we talking about when we need to be protected? Well, first, we need to be protected from miscreants. They are the people who want to hurt us using computers. Data breaches can cause economic harm. Hacking insulin pumps can cause physical harms. We address the dangers of miscreants by passing laws that criminalize their behavior. A different harm comes from Incompetent and skillless development. We want to identify competent people before they hurt us. So we set up standards of knowledge, and we set up certifications to distinguish the competence from the incompetence. There are different ways we're trying to identify competence, such as employment reviews that ask tricky coding questions. Licensing is the next step in trying to protect ourselves from incompetence. We want to bestow a license on competent professionals, and we also want to take the license away if we find that the professional is incompetent. Unfortunately, there is a third group of professionals that can cause us harm. I call them competence slumlords professionals who do the absolute least that is legally required. The slumlord's exclusive focus on maximizing profit, and because of the narrowness of this focus, they're likely to do harm when they overlook their professional responsibility to look beyond the bare minimum that is legally enforced. I have to be careful here. I'm starting to fall into a trap that's mirroring a major focus in some of the work that's going on in professionalism. That trap is talking a little too much about the bad guys. Miscreants, incompetence, slum lords are indeed scary bad guys. But if I focus too much on protection from harm, we're going to spend too much time and energy figuring out how to punish these dangerous people. An overemphasis on punishing the bad guys 
and protecting us from incompetence, I think is a distraction because I am optimistic. I firmly believe that 99% of computing professionals are good guys, men and women who want to do the right thing. Making punishment a primary goal is a distraction and does not seem to be very effective in protecting us from harm. If we focus too much on identifying and punishing the bad guys, the fog of punishment will distract us from understanding and encouraging a positive side of professionalism. One of my goals today is to emphasize the positive side of professionalism. Do we need to identify, isolate, and discourage the bad guys? Certainly. But let's also identify, encourage, and celebrate the good guys in our profession. Well, since this is an ACM event, I'll use the ACM's ethics standards as an example. But I could just as well have used the British Computer Society Code, the, computer, the Canadian Information Processing Society Code, the India Computer Society Code, or even the Shanghai Computer Society Code, to name a few. Here's what the ACM says. ACM says that ethics is fundamental to professionalism. Informing both behavior and practice is at the core of the ACM and relevant to all members. Now you've heard me use the word ethics a lot, and I have an initial here after this word ethics because this is my interpretation. When people hear the word ethics, they sometimes get into long esoteric discussions, which I hope to avoid at least today. Today I'll use a workable operating definition for ethics. Ethics is any behavior with a positive or negative impact. Any behavior where we try to avoid unjustified harm. Now using the word harm in ethics causes us some difficulty. We often use the word harm to label obvious negative impacts and ignore the positive side of ethics, which supports and promotes common core values a positive side of ethics that promotes happiness and autonomy and freedom and things of that sort. I put the word harm in quotation marks. When we talk about ethics, I think that harm also includes any limitation on these or failure to promote these common core values that are found in all sustainable human cultures. In their membership application, the ACM says it is dedicated to advancing the art, science, and engineering and application of information technology, dedicated to fostering the open interchange of information to serve both professionals and the public. And they are dedicated to the promotion of the highest professional standards. These standards have a link to the ACM's Code of Ethics. Now, the ACM's two codes provide guidelines for well-intentioned people. That's us. But even so, they provide the guidelines, and there's still a disproportionate number of software problems. What might explain this? Well, let me look at an example. In the late 1980s, there was a radiation therapy machine that many of you might have heard of called the Therac 25. It became an infamous example of bad software. The machine was capable of emitting very high, read lethal, doses of radiation. Using a standard keyboard interface, which was common at the time, you would press the X key if you wanted to fire the X-ray at a patient. But if you needed to reduce or otherwise change the settings, you would press the C key to clear things. Using this interface with the X and the C right next to each other, occasionally patients were struck with 100 times the intended dosage. This was only one of the contributing factors to the harms this device caused. Look at the placement of those keys. I am sure that the developer who chose them did not intend to fry patients with radiation. 
but he didn't. It seems that merely seeking to punish bad people doesn't resolve the harm problem in a case like this or other similar ones. The realization that good people cause harm has led some to equate failure with a failure to do what the customer wants. We even included in our professional ethics codes the belief that a good computing professional must do what the customer wants. Software engineering curricula require graduate courses in requirements elicitation. They require a study of formal requirements proofs so that we'll meet the minimum standards in delivering the customer's requested product. In this approach to professionalism, harm is reduced to failure of safety critical systems, physical harm, or if it's not physical harm, then it's failure to do what the customer wants. That's what harm means. The simplest and most dangerous version of this approach to professionalism is called the agency model of professionalism. Do what the customer wants. Now, agency, I think, is a dangerously seductive model. You can have a customer that gives you a request and it poses an exciting intellectual challenge and we just take off and work on it and have a good time. We enjoy the opportunity to exercise our special technical skills uh, or our project management skills in developing large systems. This model seems simple enough. I mean, after all, we're moral people. And as long as we're not asked to do anything immoral, what could be wrong with it? Well, we're frequently surprised by the negative impact some of some of our systems. The problem is that the agency model discourages us from looking beyond the narrow specification of the task at hand. The failure to ask who is affected leads to what I call stealth problems, problems that sneak up on us and we don't consider uh, that what we are dealing with actually transforms society. Although there's no evil event intent, the agency model can lead to rather discomforting outcomes. Let's consider for a moment the changes to society brought about by a simple barcode scanner. Let's look at something as simple as a grocery line, grocery checkout line. Last century, checkout clerks at markets had to know the prices of all of the products in the store. These clerks were actually a business asset because they knew all of the customers, provided an inviting social environment for return customers, and encouraged follow-on sales. Eventually, we computer professionals computerized this process with our new tool called a flatbed scanner. Clerks no longer see our faces because we see just the tops of their heads as they're facing down, trying to maximize the throughput of the items being scanned. This throughput, somebody elevated to the most important thing in the checkout process. Think about how this changed things from the previous model. The introduction of the flatbed scanner brought about a social change. But we realized some of the problems, so we modified things. And we made the scanner upright, so clerks could at least pretend to look at the customer. This is a major social change. Notice here how the engineers who made the scanners were not bad people. They were not incompetent. They likely fulfilled the specifications they were given. But did they think beyond those specifications to consider how they were changing society? I presume this agency model was also used when someone asked a programmer, 
simply automate sending birthday cards through Facebook? What an interesting specification. Simply automate sending birthday cards through Facebook. So what this means is I would automatically receive cards from my Facebook friends. This system works quite efficiently and works according to specification. Unfortunately, my birthday has become less, more depressing. Not because I'm getting older, but because I now receive birthday wishes from the accounts of my deceased friends. Did anyone think about this problem before implementing the automation of birthday cards? The agency approach assumes that technical practice is a value-free activity with no significant impact. That is a mistake. There is little analysis of the impacts of this system on a broad range of stakeholders. Even when software is delivered under budget, delivered early, satisfies all the functional requirements, it can still be flawed because of the negative societal impacts that were not anticipated. The agency model makes little use of computing professionals' judgment about how the software should be developed and how it might be changed to reduce its negative impact or changed to, produce it to improve its positive impact. I consider this a kind of theft from the system. The customer is charged for our talents, all of our talents, and we only give them the simple, technical part of our talents. Agency ignores the positive value of special knowledge that the professional can contribute to a project. A few years ago, I got my first e-reader after having eye surgery. The device had a wonderful interface to select the font size of books. Just tap the font size you can read, font size you can see. This looks like it's consistent with the ACM Software Engineering Code of Ethics Clause 1.1. That clause says professionals must attempt to ensure that the products of their efforts will be used in a socially responsible way, will meet social needs, and will avoid harmful effects to health and welfare. Accessibility was mine. Well, in order to ac access the font screen, I needed to press the key on that keyboard, which had an upper and lower case A on it. The key, smaller than the diameter of a number two pencil, was illegible to me. Because I couldn't see that key, I needed someone to help me before I could get to any bigger font. There's another interaction model called the paternalistic model. It leans in the opposite direction from the agency model. The paternalistic model assumes that the professional's knowledge is all that matters. You can see the paternalistic approach in many occupations. For example, a new medical intern assumes that he's the only one who matters and pompously ignores any information given about a patient's condition. Uh, this is acting paternalistically. If a computing professional adopts the paternalistic model, he or she assumes much of the decision-making power, unilaterally making decisions the professional believes to be in the best interests of society. I have a hunch that just such an attitude took this bad checkout situation we looked at and made it better by adding technology. This technology puts another machine between the customer and the checkout clerk. Now the customer doesn't have any interaction with a person, but must be frustrated and wrestle with this new technology simply to pay their bill every time they check out. I wonder who decided that this was best for the customer. Did anyone really ask the customer whether they wanted this? Most system developers have war stories about they how they misunderstood a customer's needs and did not discover their mistake until late in the system development. Paternalism leads to these costly late discoveries. 
In December, I had a great joy and a fun. I participated in the Hour of Code. Uh, it introduced millions of people to short software coding. It was a wonderful effort which encouraged me to visit other code writing tutorials. After working through the Python tutorial, uh, through the Python interpreter, I encountered this congratulatory screen, and I felt quite good about it. But then I thought, what if I was colorblind? This screen meets the technical requirement of letting you move to the next module. But if you can't see red, then the directions don't make much sense. A simple substitution would work. A simple substitution would make it work for more people. There is yet another model of the way the professional can work with people. They're not all bad. This one is called a fiduciary model. It recognizes the special knowledge of both the customer and the developer. The fiduciary model takes information from both of these sources to anticipate possible impacts of the developed system. The resulting solutions are not purely technical. There's an interactive trust relationship between the customer and the developer's professional judgments that move beyond purely technical specification and adds value to the developer's process. Positive professionalism often requires more than a simple technical solution. Consider the physician's choice of medicine as an example. Um, it involves a technical judgment about the curative, judgment, curative powers of a particular medicine. But it also involves questions about the side effects of the medicine. Interesting side effects like, is it too expensive for the patient to purchase? Is it addictive? Is it likely to cause other problems? Well, technical decisions in computing are analogous to this. We need to consider second-order effects. Becoming this kind of professional requires an emphasis on how technical skills are employed and how they minimize negative impacts and promote positive impacts. Why is it frequently difficult for us to achieve these goals? I think they're difficult to achieve for a variety of reasons, some actually having to do with us and some having to do with the way we identify and address ethical issues. Psychologists dealing with ethics say that most of us believe that we are moral. We are competent and not susceptible to ethical problems. Psychologists say that people often think they are more moral than they are. That is, we really believe we're moral, we're convinced we're competent, and as long as we have these convictions, this type of image leads us free to pay attention to other things besides ethics. This type of self-image combines with other elements of the human condition to generate more stealth problems. Many psychological experiments have been done to show the limitations of our cognition, which contribute to ethical problems. You may have seen these studies. Where, where people are asked to count the number of passes of basketball between, of basketball between players in dark shirts. During the experiment, a person is dressed as a gorilla and walks through the group and is not noticed by more than 50% of the participants. Dressed as a gorilla and walked through the, walks through the group and is not noticed. How could this be that something so obvious as a gorilla was not noticed when we originally thought it, saw it. Psychologists say this is clear evidence of our selective attention during complex situations. We often miss major details when we are concentrating on something else, and we're shocked when it is pointing out, pointed out that we did miss something. We tend to have an inflated impression of how much we actually perceive. Psychologists have shown that this limitation applies to seeing ethical issues in complex situations. The harms caused by this failure to see ethical issues are not reduced by punishing miscreants, 
nor are they reduced by requiring an additional course in C sharp. We need something else to do to address the issues. In addition to the lapses in tension, we can also fall victim to what's called a frame change, causing difficulty in seeing ethical risks at work. In frame changing, we unintentionally narrow the context of our task of, uh, of uh, task or project, excluding its ethical elements. For example, a number of years ago, a city chose to do recycling because it was the right thing to do. And they were happily surprised when they also found out that recycling happened to be profitable. Years later, when recycling stopped making a profit, the city, the city decided to abandon it. The frame had changed. Now the city only considered profit and forgot the original issue about quality of life and ethical obligations to the next generation. On a technical note, one of the investigations into the challenging disaster indicates that the failure to react to the O-ring's potentially catastrophic flaw was due to the persons in charge engaging in a frame change. The person in charge evaluated the situation from the point of view of a NASA manager concerned with the future of the program, rather than from the point of view of an engineer whose primary frame was the safety of seven astronauts. When the frame changes, the goals change. In a business frame, the goals are be competent, be successful, and unfortunately success gets interpreted frequently as whatever you can to maximize profits. In an ethics frame, the goals are be fair. Ask, will people be hurt? If we focus exclusively on one frame's goals, then the other frame's goals will completely fade. Some of our basic problem-solving methodologies, such as divide and conquer, actually encourage a narrowing of a problem, problem frame to reduce complexity. For example, Here's a UML, UML model we might consider. Uh, when developing a remote car starter button to be added to a device which already unlocks a car remotely, we might use this UML, um, UML model like this. We could put a, a car starting use case inside of the system boundary, and we tell the programmer to focus only on the actor's input, which sends an engine starting signal when the button is pressed and the actor writes the use case for the engine starter. I imagine this is what happened in Auckland, New Zealand, when this was first developed. In hilly Auckland, someone had their car parked in gear, and when coming back to the car, pressed the starter button. Unfortunately, at that moment, a lady was walking in front of the car. The car lurched forward, pinning the lady who went to the hospital. In this case, the boundary or frame framed out this woman as a stakeholder. The way we use UML tool contributed to framing out important stakeholders. In the system design, there was a failure to consider stakeholders outside of the system boundary. It would have been simple to limit the starting functionality only to cars which had automatic transmission and were in park if the, if the system had provided a mechanism or encouraged us to consider people who were in danger outside of these boundaries. I've mentioned several problems leading to good people making mistakes. But there are ways to mitigate some of these risks for us. There are a number of things we can do. During developing a project, we may have focused very tightly on modularizing a problem, having very adequate pieces of code. But before we implement it, armed with this tentative technical solution, we should try to reframe the event outside of its purely technical and business structures. We should try and remove the problem before we code it into concrete. 
write down your ideas writing down your ideas and solutions is important because as we all know the world moves on and will encounter other and will encounter other distractors which cause us to lose problems on the lose focus on the problems we've identified and problems we may need to address it would be a shame to be reminded of those concerns when they were manifested in a deployed system rather than taken care of before the system went out. Framing out social and ethical risks in order to narrowly focus on cost and schedule may make life very easy in the short run, but it's a significant mistake in the long run. Ethical risks cause software to harm people or to be recalled or, worse, to be left in the field, continuing to harm those who are affected by it. Let your staff know that you really value their professional judgment. Actually make ethics part of a performance review. Publicly reward the person who calls attention to the fact that using light gray letters on a dark gray background would be difficult for visually impaired citizens to use on a voting machine. The test for a computing job should include questions about how to develop an interface, how a user will interact with it. You look for the technical skills, but more importantly, and of equal value, I think is a broader view that you take. You think it's important to use technical case tools. I think it's just as important to use socio-ethical tools. STIR uses a decision model, an interview protocol, to specify the interplay between technical and social considerations. These things contribute to a broadly reflective environment where your coder codes better because they understand and anticipate social and ethical impacts. Civil engineers routinely do a study of the environmental impacts before they start a project. Software developers should probably do the same. They should develop a software development impact statement before they start to code. You need to understand the context in which your system will operate. It's a mistake for a computing professional to limit considered stakeholders only to customer, developer, vendor, and user. The question, who is affected, may actually include social structures, as in the case of our checkout scheme, customers, or the environment. There are three questions you can ask that will help you identify relevant stakeholders. You can ask whose behavior and work process will be affected, whose circumstances or job will be affected, whose under, uh, and understanding the potential stakeholders and who they are helps us to proactively anticipate potential risks and deliver a better product. For any project you undertake, there are a wide variety of solutions. They will each have different effects on the stakeholders. As computing professionals, we need to use our judgment about these impacts. Codes of ethics help us identify critical ways about how systems impact others. Codes of ethics show us, professionals, what we expect of each other and also what the public has a right to expect of us. The codes encourage us to be as good as we hope we are. The preamble to the ACM Software Engineering Code of Ethics provides some guidance on how to use the code, and I think it applies to most professional codes. If there is some ethical tension not specifically answered in the code, then look at the gist of the code rather than looking at it as a checklist. Use your professional judgment. How would the public view your decisions? Would your acts be judged worthy of the ideal computing professional? Notice that it does not say, do whatever someone wants. Reviewing these principles is one way to employ positive professional judgment in choosing the best way to complete a project. When you decide to develop a system, your decision is an ethical one. It's an ethical decision about how you will interact with the client, 
It's an ethical decision about the responsibility you will take for users and others impacted by your decision. Deciding to ignore these issues is a decision. And it's a decision, I think, that has a negative ethical impact. When talking about professionalism, unfortunately, many have framed out its ethical component. Professionalism is not just about punishing the bad guy you don't like or showing that you have the skill to program the latest Internet of Things device. Being an ethical computing professional means making a positive contribution and by doing good and avoiding evil. That's what counts for you. That's what counts for us as professionals and also for society. Let's move on to some questions and answers. Thank you, Don. We have lots of fascinating questions. Unfortunately, we're not going to get to all of them, so let's get right to one. This question says, 2020 hindsight makes some ethical issues obvious, but how do you identify issues that are unanticipated? Is, can you make some suggestions that will help us anticipate what would otherwise go unanticipated? Um, the first part of the question, uh, it's easy to identify uh, these issues in hindsight, but some of them, like the use of the, the proximity of the X and C key, would probably have been thought of if someone thought for a moment about the way they typed and how somebody um, uses the keyboard. The, uh, the first thing so you're, so is, you're saying just the attitude will help. The, the attitude will help, but there's, but there's two things. The first portion of the question sometimes gets used as an excuse. The excuse is, well, since I can't anticipate everything, I don't have to be bothered. Now, I will not tell you the labels I give that kind of excuse. Uh, the fact that you can't anticipate every difficulty you have driving down the street doesn't mean that you should pay no attention to people who may be approaching the roadway from the side or something like that. What you need to do is my simplest way to encourage people to do this is when you do a technical solution to a problem, you need to start to consider who is anticipated, who, who, who will be using this. Um, the most current example I've just read about, Google having uh, uh, contact lenses that will detect the, uh, whether some blood sugar in the tear ducts of people who are diabetics so that they won't have to in, uh, uh, use a needle to um, detect the sugar. Um, there's been several criticisms that have come out about this enterprise because the people are saying the kinds of questions I raised. Who's impacted? why the people who can afford to wear contact lenses and who wear contact lenses. Well, one of the things we know about diabetics is they're discouraged from wearing contact lenses. Another thing we know about contact lenses is that they cost money, and so people in poorer countries might be better served, instead of by contact lenses, by a patch that goes on their skin. If the technology was in the contact lens, Maybe it could be in a patch as well. Now, I'm talking way outside of my professional skill, but I hope that the people who are working on this start to examine these issues as well. Ask some questions about the stakeholders, and one of the things that's sometimes a boring task but interesting is sit down and read the Software Engineering Code of Ethics. That there, gives you, you some hints as to what you might think about. I want to get to some other questions, Don. Uh, you also okay. have a, a, a software tool that helps you do some of this thinking of the stakeholders. Isn't that correct? The SOTUS tool? Uh, yes. There's a, there's a process that we've worked on for a number of years called the Software Development Impact Statement. Um, we developed it as a uh, manual process that took a little bit of time, and so we gave it to a company in Australia, uh, gave the whole process away, and uh, it's available at a company called Software Improvements. 
you can look at it, and I've got to be careful here. I'm not selling the product. Read about the software development impact statement. Look up my name and that. And it's a process you can do on your own and incorporate. Figure out what your task is. Ask who the stakeholder is involved. And ask what impact. That is, take your task. Will requiring, uh, suppose we have the requirement of a driver's license in order to vote. And you simply ask of the task, what effect will that requirement have on a stakeholder? Young, healthy people, none. What impact will it have on older citizens, senior citizens who are uh, bound to nursing homes? It will disenfranchise them. And the software tool helps you work through this to make uh, to right. help you not ignore certain right. Okay, uh, let's move on to right. another question. Are all ethics issues big? Um, and also, um, some in the same question, uh, they, they um, some people think that really big ethical issues will simply be taken care of in lawsuits and I wondered if you want to comment on that. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, one, ethics is different from law. So we have ethical things like, um, did the people who developed that first interface on the Kindle, which is much improved now, but were they violating any law? And the answer is no. Were the people who picked the X and C key on the Therac machine violating any law? And the answer is no. What happens is ethics involves a lot of professional judgment on our part about how best to do things. Laws tend to be slow to be enacted. Uh, laws tend to be um, slow to uh, come to decisions. I do expert witness work, and some of it is on cases that are almost eight years old. Um, and so it's too slow. Um, our technology moves too fast. By the time we make a law about um, how to uh, handle um, an e-reader, we'll find that um, there will be contact lenses that <laughs> we can use instead of any reader. Yeah, and and also I, I think you're right what you say about the law, and also the law tends to push this don't do these terrible bad things um, instead of uh, celebrating and encouraging good behavior. This is another question we had. How do we celebrate good ethical behavior? How do we encourage uh, positive software engineering rather than always just punishing the negative. Do you have any suggestions about how to celebrate good ethical behavior? Um, what happens, unfortunately, is we narrow the frame in our business very tightly, and the ethics issues get framed out of our considerations. Um, and what I would advocate is that there are some companies that actually use ethics in the performance review. It isn't check a tick box, did you do a good ethical job? But I know, for example, that there are voting machines out there. Uh, I'm a, uh, I work in, uh, with people who are voting in the polling place. And uh, I know there are voting machines out there that have gray letters on a gray background. And in order to look at it, you've got to put your head over the voting machine covering the light. So people who are visually challenged can't read that. Wouldn't the person who worked at that company who said to their boss, maybe we shouldn't use a gray-on-gray -gray combination. It will sell better and people will like it more if we use a better color choice or if we facilitate changing the colors. And, and, wouldn't it be nice, and wouldn't it be nice if the person who figured that out because they were thinking about the users would get a, 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 a fatter paycheck or at least a pat on the back by the corporation? Fatter paycheck, bonus. Um, there are some companies that have ethics awards. 
Um, yeah. And notice this this particular thing doesn't sound like a big question, but the impact it has is amazing. I mean, I can tell you that when I completed my eye surgery, coming to that e-reader and hoping to be able to read and then just having it reinforced how disabled I still was had a very negative impact. I mean, that's changed and things have considerably improved since then. But all ethics issues are not big issues about the nuclear bomb or the missile or things of that sort. Um, okay, as somebody, uh, you talked about positive and negative issues, and in a lot of the cases we talked about today, it was pretty clear that almost everybody would say, yes, that's positive or oh, that's really negative. But when we determine positive and negative societal impact, sometimes the question is more nuanced. Isn't it possible that's what's what's positive for one population may be negative for a different population? And then how do you deal with that when you're working uh, in ethics in computing? Okay. Um, Two-part response. Um, cultures are different. But one of the things that we seem to come out, Keith and I are working on writing up some of this, um, that there seems to be common ethical elements across cultures that fit computing. Um, some of the basic standards when we developed the Software Engineering Code of Ethics was rather amazing because what we found was we had this multinational committee setting up what are the responsibilities of a software engineer? And whether you're in Malaysia or Singapore or Tumbarumba, if you say that I'm a software engineer and I'm not going to test my product before I deliver it, all of those people from different cultures will say that's a mistake. So some of the ways we do our technical stuff seem to be consistent. The other question is, well, cultures are different. So you don't shake with your left hand in India. Um, you um, don't have um, middle names in some cultures. And those are differences which we can easily honor. The other issues about privacy and so on um, differ even in proximate cultures. So in England, we have the uh, Data Protection Agency, which worries about and tries to enforce data protection and then then there's the USA, and I'll leave that comment kind of hanging there like that. And one of the things you can do is you provide different tools for different cultures. That is, you can honor privacy in the way that culture honors it. But the common element is if you have an issue of, well, this culture says we ought to behead people who have red hair, um, there seems to be a fairly, that I guess is a fairly easy example, isn't it? Um, you don't want to don't want to code that. So, um, so what the nuanced uh, ones? Some of them are just tough. Yeah, and and but, and and it is tough. And we we don't want to give people the idea that oh, if you pay attention to the ethics, everything's easy. These are design problems, <laughs> and they're messy. It's just that you need this perspective to answer them skillfully. I think. So he, here's another question, Don. How do we break the temptation? to just add more technology when we notice that there is a problem? <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm in this business because I love it, and I'm a, a gizmo person. And uh, um, you break it by making a big sign, and you put it over your desk, and you, you ask a question, how will others react to it? How can I resolve it? some of the ways to solve things. I mean, we solve noise problems by putting sound-reducing headphones on our ears that are connected to electricity. Turn off the television. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I don't have, a, I don't have a, a catch-all answer to it. I fall, we, we all, here, here's one of the points of this talk. We all fall into these traps. We all love what we're doing. And we all, I and you, make framing problems and frame things out. And what we've got to do is just before we commit things and put it in concrete, we have to take a moment and go, let me think about how this would 
work. Let me ask my wife how she'd react to this, putting this new device between her and the clerk in the store, making her fish for a credit card when she has money. So Thank, I, um, I, I like this, Don. We're, we're almost out of time, and I wanted to put in a couple more comments from that people sent in, Okay. Um, which I thought were particularly fun to, to think about. Uh, someone said, I think the order of avoid evil and do good should be reversed. Do good first yes. and avoid evil. Good idea. There was a great question that perhaps needs a whole other webinar, and that is uh, questions about the brain, both the digital effect of, uh, of, of our devices on our brains, but then also digital ways we're seeing the brain and how that is broadening our understanding of what's going on when we try to do the right thing or we... Uh, you know, how our brain limits us but enables us um, ethically. So, you know, the whole there's a whole big kind of issue that has to do with that. Um, here's another one. Maybe you want to comment quickly on this one. Doesn't the traditional separation of the analyst in requirement development and the code production of a developer, uh, doesn't th don't those traditional uh, roles distance both of these from the systems as delivered? So yes, but the answer to that question is yes. I'm sorry, was there more? Well, um, yeah. Well, so so, but, but and and how do you you almost need some kind of um, siloing, some kind of specialization to get these huge problems done? How do you deal with that? Right, you silo the problem, and that's the way we do it. I mean, I've worked on these kinds of systems, but once you say, here's the problem and here's my solution, let's do this solution, and this is the way I'll do a barcode scan, et cetera, et cetera, and all the logic, then you say, if I do it this way, how will it affect people? And this is not, you can anticipate the people who are going to use your banking system or your ATM. We had ATM do dro doors that fell down and locked when you took money out, out of them in the old environment. And nobody asked, well, what happens if a little kid is there while their parent is taking something out and this door comes down and locks? It happened. We trapped kids' fingers in ATM machines because nobody, the programmer, the analyst, or anybody, asked that additional question. Um, I ought to respond. I forgot to say something. It, if there is interest in me talking about this process, about how you do software development impact, uh, there is a possibility that this might come on as a webinar later in the year. Okay. Uh, someone Other asked, is there, is there a particular software engineering ethics c code? Uh, and and uh, the answer there is yes, and Don was instrumental in getting that code passed by both the ACM and the IEEE, so you, you can find that out on the web. Um, it's in, it's but, listed in the resources. The web link is in the uh, in, in the resource page at the back. There we go. Um, so uh, here's a here's a comment that has to do with open source platforms, and um, this our participant believes that the paternalistic model is fading with the air era of open source platforms that facilitate more open discussion about what software does. you want to comment on that? Um, that, that my answer to that is um, a categorical. It depends. One of the attitudes about open source is, you've given me your open source code. Why did you code it in that silly way? Let me fix it and make it better. And I know of several cases where the let me fix it and make it better, has totally messed up the code and the processing and didn't take critical things into consideration. Uh, so, yeah, the paternalistic mode is fading, but I think we fall into it um, where we think, oh, I know the technology and how to do it better than better than you and the way in which we ought to do it ignores, continues to ignore some of the user considerations. Okay. So Here's I'm not optimistic. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. 
Okay, go ahead. So, yeah, so open source has opportunities, but it is not a panacea for this kind of problem. Right. Um, here's a question that says, what the customer wants may be incorrect and, correct and create ethical issues, uh, and what the customer needs can be different. However, uh, if you decide, if the, the developer decides that, then it's uh, paternalism instead of fiduciary, right? If the developer decides that, but one of the things that I've done, uh, I found it amazing that, that people who are in business, if you think you see something wrong with what they're doing, and you specify and offer them an alternative way to do it, and explain to them how it might improve things, one of two things happens. Uh, they thank you and uh, are your best inside salesperson in a company forever. Uh, I had that happen in several military organizations. Or they look at you and they say, what's wrong with you? You don't understand what's going on and you would have developed the system in a wrong-headed way. And they tend to be right in both of those things. I mean, I've learned... So, paternalism, we tend to think we're moral, we're right, and we know what's going on. And uh, we work in businesses that uh, that we have no understanding of. I mean, we did a program to do genetic mutation for a biologist, and he came in and he started to talk about the genetic mutation of two heterozygotes doing this, and he wanted us to model that, and our jaws were on the table because right. we and, couldn't and tell that, that is part of that, – that seems to be part of why this is a difficult job, why to do this professionally is tough because of the infinite malleability of computing that we can jump from project to project and have to have this generalized knowledge. And I, I think it's so important that what you talked about in the fiduciary model where it's a partnership, where there is communication and respect between the customer and the developer. And that's absolutely necessary for us to make our way through these nuanced, difficult questions, I think. Now, there is the uh, by, by the way, Don, the, the, the organizers are sending us all sorts of messages. These are such fabulous questions, and people have brought up so many great issues that we are way over time. So okay. I, th I, think we, I think we better get... Uh, uh, we got to say, first of all, thank you to everyone for these really important, interesting questions. And uh, somehow we're going to try and deal with them offline after this event because they really are wonderful. Uh, this is a wonderful discussion going on, but <laughs> we have to get going here. So um, let's move to the last slide here. Um, this webinar was recorded and will be available online in a few days at learning.acm.org slash webinar. You can find announcements on up upcoming webinars and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and acm.org. Also, right here you see a link to a survey. It would really help us if you would please fill out this survey by clicking on the URL that's on the screen now where you can talk about this webinar, but you can also suggest future topics or speakers. This is Keith Miller and Don Goddard saying goodbye for now, and remember to do good and avoid evil. Take care, and thanks again for joining us today.